Pastor George from the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle right here in Chetwin and uh, welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just pause with me for a moment of prayer. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. The Apostle Paul was a great man. He was idolized in the world of Judaism before he became a born-again Christian. And when Paul became a born-again Christian, he was idolized from the Christian church perspective. But something happened in between. Paul had a tremendous transformation that transformed him from a sinner to a saint. One of the objections or the objectives of Paul when he was Saul was to actually eliminate the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was desirous of doing that. He put a lot of energy and hope um, into that prospect of literally getting the church out of the way. And one day, under the authority of certain people, he was on his way to Damascus to again arrest Christians, to jail them, and possibly have them killed. But God had something special planned for him, and on that road, on that particular day, God came to Saul. And he called him by name and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul responded with a question that any of us would ask. He said, and who are you, Lord? And Jesus responded, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now, before his conversion, nobody told Saul what to do. He was a man of authority. He is a man who knew where he was going and how he was going to get there. He is the guy who gave the orders. And yet on this day, Jesus said to him, get up, Go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And so this man had gone into the city and he was there for three days and he was blind. And God came and said to Ananias, I want you to go into the city and I want you to talk to this guy Saul and I want you to give him some instructions. And here's what Jesus said, go this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Now listen to this statement. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Paul doesn't even realize yet what is actually happening in his spirit or in his life. And he is going to be reminded of the fact, because of the transformation that has taken place in his life, he's actually going to suffer for Jesus. Absolutely phenomenal. And after the dust had settled and Saul was changed to Paul, he became one of the greatest evangelists on the planet outside of Jesus Christ. And one day Paul was writing to the Roman church and he made this tremendous statement. Remember his background and the transformation. And he said to the church at Rome, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Another translation renders it this way. I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. Now, we all want to hear good news. We want to hear something exciting. We want to hear something encouraging. 
I, I think we're all waiting and wondering and praying that uh, the cure for COVID will soon come, that it's just on the horizon. And it will be great news when somebody announces the fact that we've arrived, we've got it, good news. We're going to be able to prevent further deaths. Good news is awesome. But what is the good news that the Apostle Paul is sharing here? We're going to speak today knowing that the Word of God is my source of authority. And so anything I say from a Christian perspective, from a theological perspective, is based on the fact that my source of authority is the Word of God. And so what is the good news? The fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Is that the good news that Paul is talking about? The great flood that God brought upon the planet to annihilate humankind? Is that the good news that the Apostle Paul wants to talk about? How about the Word of God that talks about hell? separation from God, the Bible that talks about floods, earthquakes, famine, war, nations rising against nation. Is that the good news that Paul is presenting as he writes to the book or writes to the Romans in the book of, of Romans? Is, is Paul suggesting that that's great? This is good. This is what I'm going to preach. Today, we live in, in, a, in a society, in the kind of a culture where we want to hear good stuff. We want to hear stuff that will lift us up, stuff that will move us forward. And so I'm anxious when I read this, I'm anxious even in my own spirit based on the Word of God to come up with some good news that I might be able to share with people. Now, here it is. When Paul says, I am not ashamed of the good news, I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul is saying the good news is this. The good news is that regardless of the fall of Adam and Eve, regardless of the great flood that covered the earth, Regardless of the word that teaches about hell and separation from God and floods and earthquakes and famines and wars and nations rising against nation, against the background of all of this stuff, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this. In spite of our past, God loves us. God loves us even though we have sinned. God loves us though we are sinning, and God will love us as we continue to sing, sin. The Bible teaches that because of the sin of Adam and Eve, death came to humankind because of that initial sin. And so as death came through the sin of Adam and Eve, life comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you what, the good news is John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The good news is John 10 and 10. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The good news is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. When someone becomes a new Christian, he becomes a brand new person on the inside. He is not the same anymore and a new life has begun. The good news is that the good news is for everybody. And as we listen to what's happening around us today, we realize that a lot of people are living, but not a lot of people are enjoying life. And so I want to encourage you today to understand that the good news is that God loves you through Jesus Christ. The good news is that nothing can come your way that God is not already aware of. And by His grace and His mercy and because of His love, we can become more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved us. You want to have some good news today? God still loves you. He will love you today and He will love you tomorrow. And in the name of Jesus, I would suggest 
And I would pray that you'd have an awesome day. His blessings upon you. Amen. Pastor Bill Evans, Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church in the big city of Chetwin, B.C., Canada. I say that because um, Leo Sobolski used to say, our stuff is watched all over the world. So wherever you're watching in Chetwin or whatever, we welcome you to a celebration of worship and adoration of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, we, uh, the different churches are taking part in this program, as you'll notice and see, so we're glad for that, and especially for Chet Television and Marlon for uh, putting this together and being the brains behind it. Um, we're going to be looking at a passage from the life of David today, and I uh, just want to ask God's blessing on our time. God, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It gets us from this dark old world into the presence of our God, all through faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It just keeps pointing that way. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for you, our Heavenly Father, whom we wait to see one day in his presence. So receive our thanks for these things in this time. Bless each heart and each home hearing, listening in today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My Bible says David's last song. 2 Samuel 23. These are the last words of David. It says, David, the son of Jesse, declares. And what I like about this first part here is, is the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The book of Psalms, uh, there was a funeral the other day in the States for a Jewish lady, and they sang, I think Psalm 18 or something like that. They, somebody was, I heard this lady sing, and they said, that was Psalm 18. And um, the, the, the song book of Israel was written by this man, David. He was the great king of Israel, and, and he had this anti-type person down the road and his son, Jesus. But this uh, man is on his last physical legs there, and uh, he's writing his words. And um, it's interesting just the things that he says, for truly uh, is not my house so with God, for he has made an everlasting covenant with me, and he's ordered all things uh, and secured for all my salvation and all my desire. Um, interesting thing that David would say God secured and is interested in the things of, of his desire. But as David carries on in this story before us here today, we want to see that um, one of the things he does, he, he likes to, and, and the Apostle Paul later on, often in his epistles when he writes, he closes off by acknowledging people, as we've done today with Marlon and, and Rachel being with us here, and uh, that, um, that we like to acknowledge and affirm. The word today in the vernacular of the day is to uh, everybody likes to be affirmed. And, and, and David does that and Paul does that. And, and so uh, today we want to note a, a couple of guys uh, that David uh, affirms. And it's a wonderful story. And I heard this story one time. I was at a seminar down in um, uh, Oregon and Washington, I guess. Um, anyhow, and a famous old preacher, Ray Steadman, was there teaching us how to preach about uh, ex opening up the Word of God and finding truths. And so he takes this text, and this text is simple. 
Isaiah or 2 Samuel 23, verse 20 says, And then Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabdiel, who had done mighty deeds, killed two uh, lion like men of Moab, and he also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. And that's what I want to leave with you today, just a few thoughts. Um, this story is, is about this guy. So David talks about this man, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. So he, he knows the guy's name and he knows whose dad he was. Uh, son, he was of, the, of dads and uh, Jehoiada. And, and he was a valiant man, we're told. He had gone out and seemingly in the army and the works of David. He had, uh, and Moab was a, a people that uh, Israel had struggles with and they often fought with and whatever. So uh, he went out and he killed two of their line like men. And as you go through the story of David and Goliath and whatever, and this man here killed some giant, my, uh, some lion-like men from the uh, people of Moab. Uh, but that was what he did as part of his service in the army. But it seems like on a day off, he went hunting or something. And he went out and, and, he, and he somehow, there was a lion in a pit. We don't know the whole story, how it got there or whatever. But he went down into that pit to tackle that lion, to kill that lion. Is that plausible? Is that feasible? Where one would think not, not a smart thing to just generally do. But this man was brave enough to do it. And he went down to this pit. It was not only in a pit with a lion, but it was a snowy day. So you had slippery and uh, cold uh, and whatever. And maybe uh, he was uh, running around, maybe chasing this cat because it's killing his sheep or whatever like that. But he's in this lion, with this lion in this pit on a snowy day. And as our friend that took the story there, uh, lions, they're, they're, they're a killing machine. And, and we, we have cougars around here, and they, they kill animals, and they kill deer, and you can Google now and see everything like that, and whatever. And the lion is a killing machine. It, it's the king of the beast, it says. And, and he's in this pit facing this lion. You know, in our world today, we live with the COVID story, and uh, here it is, fall, heading into winter. And... Uh, God's faithful. The seasons follow. We've had a good summer. We've got fall happening because the leaves are falling off the tree. And um, a little friend that lives at our house says from her country, leaves fall off the tree, but they don't call it fall. Okay? The, um, it is. We get winter coming. And, and it can be hard. The days get shorter. Uh, you notice how often, how early now the, the, the days are, the sun doesn't come up till uh, after seven. And, and so winter comes, and the days get shorter. It starts getting cold. And you gotta, um, my wife has command start, would you go start the car? And uh, so you, you, it's colder. You've got to do those things. The roads are bad for traveling. You don't travel as much. And it's like a lion in a pit on a snowy day. But there's worse than that, because the devil likes to play with us as well. We try to walk our Christian faith, and we trip up a little bit. And the devil comes along and says, call yourself a Christian, eh? And uh, you um, just call yourself a Christian and you act like that. And the devil likes to play. And he's the lion in the pit on the snowy day sometimes. We have to be careful of. This man taught us an interesting lesson as he looked at that story. Say, because you're saying, well, God, you throw that story in there, it's interesting, but what does it mean? What does it mean? And the man pointed this out when you draw from the text what is found there. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada. Benaiah's name meant, means God builds. God builds. And if we can catch on in our lives when we go through things, that uh, God builds. Whatever happens in our day, God builds. What, what things that was wrong, you feel in your life, whatever, God builds. And he's always responsible because if he doesn't stop it from happening, because he can, then he, he has allowed it. But God builds. And why does he build things? Because somebody made this statement, whatever don't kill you only makes you stronger. And so God uh, allows things to happen, allows us to stub our toe, allows us to uh, fall down sometimes, allows us to even, I'll stand back a little bit and see how you'll handle that in your own uh, power uh, if you're not going to look to me. And then God will stand back and let things happen. But when it does, he says, I want you to know God builds. He says, I work all things after the counsel of my own will. And so that doesn't give us a, as a challenge to be free to sin. That's a very dangerous attitude. But God's in control and he watches because that's the very next thought. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, 
means God knows. Jehoiada means God knows. And so when we have our things that we realize, why am I going through this? Well, I don't know, but God has built it. God has allowed it. Why has God allowed it? Whatever doesn't kill us only makes us stronger. You take a little tomato plant that grew in my garden and it grew up because it was free uh, range tomato seed and it grew up and it's big and strong. But you plant your own tomato seed, put it in the window, put the, lots of water out, whatever grows up, the spinny little thing and falls over and is useless. God builds the little volunteer tomato plant strong and healthy. And when we struggle with things, God knows. He knows the end from the beginning of all things. He knows our sitting down, our uprisings, and our whatever, our fears. He knows the things that hurt. He knows whatever hurts we've had in our lives. He knows those things. And he asks us to just consider coming to him, that we would come to him with our struggles and those hurts that we have. He knows them, and he doesn't want you to give them to him and say, here, God, would you take one in? He wants you to pass them to him and stand back and see what he does. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went down a pit, killed a lion on a snowy day. God builds, and God knows. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the awesome God that you are. You love us. You care for us. You sent Jesus to die for our sins. He hung up on a cross, and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you let him die because that was the plan to deal with our redemption. We thank you for that truth and that story, and we thank you again for the chance to present these truths uh, to the people of our viewing audience. And we ask your grace and your help and your blessing upon each hurting heart and each home uh, and each person that would hear these thoughts today. God knows and God builds. So help them to trust you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past 14 years, Chetwin, BC has been giving artists the chance to carve their dreams. Artists come from all over the world in June and leave us with stunning sculptures. Wood plays a vital role in this town. It's ingrained everywhere you look. I like the hippo, and uh, even though my buddy here uh, carved the moose last year I bought off of him, I still have to go with the hippo this year. What do you like about it? 
I just like it's different. It's completely different from what we've seen up here. We don't see a lot of that uh, African type things. You know, it's all eagles, bears, and it's all that kind of stuff. So that's just unique this year. So that's why I'm voting for it this year. What are you carving? Uh, yeah. I carve uh, hippo and uh, rhino. Yeah. Why? Uh, my, my son, favorite animal. important almost confession of she changed me and so he wanted to honor her in a way by having her checkmate and saying wow she's exceptional she's not someone who just messes around in fancy outfits she's an educated person to be respected well heck everybody wants to be in the top three but just to be here I'm happy if I could pull it off and have it look somewhat like a woman even Gaga, that would be great. As long as it doesn't look like Harmon Munster, I think I've done my job. I was born in the fields, that is my only home, and the place is a band, they call me righteous world, oh, 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 no.